All right. So for people who are coming in now, uh, attendees, we are starting on screen, which is something we haven't done in a long time. Um, yeah, and, and while everyone filters in, I'm just gonna ramble. <laughs> um, I decided that we should start on screen just so people can see the great setup that Mark and Aaron have going. Um, there they are, hello. Um, and you can see Kim, uh, an MBF volunteer down there too. I don't know where we are on your grid, but thank you so much for joining us. My introduction is a little bit long, um, so I'm just gonna jump into it and then Aaron and Mark are gonna do their thing. So um, while people continue to filter in, I'll just, I'll keep going and then turn it over. So um, again, welcome to this Montana Book Festival event featuring the newly anointed Poet Laureate for the state of Montana, Mark Gibbons and Aaron Parrott. So again, welcome you too. Uh, this event is sponsored by a number of different organizations and businesses here in the area, including the Camino Mexican Kitchen and Agave Bar, Arts Missoula, MissoulaEvents.net, The Whitefish Review, Humanities Montana, and the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation. Uh, an enormous thank you for all of our, uh, to all of our sponsors and uh, our supporters. My name is Lauren Korn. I'm the director of the Montana Book Festival. I am zooming in from my office in the Mountain Press Publishing Company building here in Missoula, Montana. The Montana Book Festival acknowledges that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell peoples. The name Missoula comes from the Bitterroot Salish word in Missoulitko, which means place of freezing water. This name has been used for over 12,000 years since the existence of Glacial Lake Missoula. The first Europeans who came here borrowed the Salish term in Mizzoulitko and modified the word to Missoula. Later, when glacial Lake, Lake Missoula melted, the Bitterroot Salish began using an additional term for Missoula, which means place of the small bull trout. In 1855, the Bitterroot Salish were forced to sign the Hellgate Treaty, and following this treaty, the United States government carried out forced assimilation, removal, and genocide against the Salish and other peoples in their efforts to acquire land. Despite centuries of colonial theft and oppression, the Tutiakan people are still here and thriving in their Aboriginal lands. The Montana Book Festival strives and we will continue to strive to help promote indigenous voices as one of the ways our organization acknowledges and respects the Aboriginal peoples of Missoula. For those of you zooming in from outside of Missoula, I know there are plenty of you. I encourage you to let us know where you're zooming in from. Uh, Kim Berry, who you can see somewhere in your grid there, uh, is working on the back end with me here. Um, they're going to throw a link in the chat that can help you identify which territories uh, and lands you are currently occupying. So if you'd like, please throw your locations into the chat so we can see where you're zooming in from. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, again, before I turn things over to Mark and Aaron. Um, I'd like to invite you as attendees to submit your questions via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm going to leave Mark and Aaron al alone <laughs> for their conversation, but I'm going to jump back in at the end of their conversation um, and help moderate those questions. So those will be relegated to the last 10 minutes or so of the hour. Um, feel free to use the chat function here in Zoom webinar space to talk amongst yourselves while the event is taking place. On the back end of things, uh, Kim and I will be throwing links out and just kind of engaging you in that space as well. Um, and I also want to note that if you're interested in purchasing Mark's newest book of poetry, In the Weeds, out from the Drum Lumen Institute, you can do so through our festival bookseller, Fact and Fiction Books, who resides here in Missoula, Montana as well. Um, you can go into the brick and mortar store and say MBF at checkout, or you can go to factandfictionbooks.com and enter MBF at checkout to get... Um, not to get, to make sure that 20% of that sale comes back to the festival. We're very grateful to Fact and Fiction for doing that. With that, I would like to finally introduce to you Mark Gibbons and Aaron Parrott. Mark Gibbons' poems have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies. His first chapbook of poems, Something Inside Us, was self-published in 1995, and a second, Circling Home, won the Scattered Cairns Press chapbook competition in 1999. Uh, Connemara Moonshine, the, full, the first full-length collection of his poetry, was published in 2002 by Camp Horweed Press, followed by Blue Horizon in 2007 from Two Dogs Press. War, Madness, and Love, a collaborative collection of poems with Appalachian poet Michael Revere, appeared in 2008 R, uh, from r, r Publishing. And Mark, I feel like I slaughter this term every time I have to say your bio. Mavesis Airbase? Will you, will you pronounce that for me? Mavese Airb. Mauvais air, a bilingual Herb. translation. Say that again. Mauvais herb. 
Arab, Mauvais Arab, a bilingual translation of his poems into French was published in 2009 by Propos Two Editions in France. Forgotten Dreams was published in 2012, Shadow Boxing in 2014, The Imitation Blues in 2017, uh, and Mostly Cloudy in 2020 are all available from Foothills Publishing. Mark established Blind Horse Press in 2011. He is the editor of two poetry collections for Drum Lemon Institute, Moving On, The Last Poems of Ed Leahy in 2018, uh, and Summer Lightning, 2019, by Mary Laura Wilson. He lives in Missoula with his wife, Pam, where he writes and teaches poetry. And as I said at the top of this hour, in 2021, this year, Mark was named the 2021-2022 Poet Laureate of Montana. So welcome, Mark. Thank and Aaron you. Parrott is the author of the award-winning short story collection, Maple and Lead, among other works. He is the executive director of the educational nonprofit Drum Lemon Institute, which has published works by such Montana writers as Ed Leahy, Mary Laura Win Wilson, and Mark Gibbons, Rick, De Rick DeMarinis, sorry, and Roger Dunsmore, just to name a few. He teaches literature and writing at the University of Providence. Thank you for bearing with me while I read your bios there and welcome Mark and Aaron. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So maybe we should start with uh, talking about how we met because I can't really remember, except I know that I got to know you pretty well through Poetry Out Loud. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I, I, and I say the first time I think I remember meeting you was at the Mon Missoula Art Museum. You came over with Bill Here. Borneman. Right for uh, Peter Koch's uh, Montana Gothic. We don't have that book to show <laughs> at hand, but it's here in the house. Oh, uh, that's right. That's did, right. Did you do that? Did Drum Lemon do Montana Gothic? Reprint? No, or that was uh, from uh, Wonder Range. Yeah, Peter Koch did it, but okay. I wrote a long essay for it, as did uh, Ed Dobb and some other people. Dave Thomas. And Dave Thomas has a long section in there, and yeah, he had a little event here, and that is that's exactly where I met you. But then. Um, every year, how long have we been doing Poetry Out Loud together for at least six or eight years? Oh yeah, something like that. I, the, uh, <clears throat> I think it started in, uh, did it start in 2010 or is it before that Poetry Out Loud? It must have been before that. Poetry yeah, I think so. Yeah. Started. And uh, so you must have showed up about I missed the first year. Yeah, I, I think 2011 was the first year I did it. Okay. But uh, for people who don't know, it's maybe worth talking about because I think it it relates to, you know, why I got interested in your poetry. Poetry Out Loud is sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts. Is that right? Right. And the Poetry Foundation. <laughs> and the Poetry Foundation. And it's a, a program where high school kids memorize and then recite uh, poetry. Right. And, you know, they don't have to write the poetry, they recite these famous poems. Um, and the, I think the process of recitation really opens them up to poetry. And they hire locals to be the judges for the contest at the state level. And that's where you and I came in. Right. And then after all the students have done their thing, then the judges have to get up and <laughs> recite some poetry sort of mentoring these kids and mark is a great reader so i you know i know we're going to hear him read here in a minute but um i also want to say that the experience of not just poetry out loud and hearing him recite his poems and ed Leahy poems um but hanging out with poets like mark and dave thomas and cheryl nosey uh, really changed my mind about poetry, which I always previously thought was kind of a snobby, effete <laughs> domain of dudes in, uh, you know, tweed jackets with leather patches and Smoking ethereal bus. women, you know. With English. Their, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, you know, I knew that other Ogden Nash and Robert Service also wrote poetry, but it was hanging out with these guys that really opened my eyes to, you know, what a working class pursuit it is. And, you know, Ed Leahy for, is a great example of somebody who was very working class, but also really educated, so. Yeah, well, and, that, and that's how we kind of, I mean, I, I think I, I kind of went at, I mean, I went at you at that 
Missoula Art Museum thing with Ed Leahy in mind, I think, because see, Ed had passed away in 2011. Well, Ed passed away in 2011. So, so uh, I, that must have been just after that, that event at the right. museum. And, uh, and, and I had collected uh, the, re the stuff that was left in his apartment that his family had gone through you know the stuff that they wanted and the stuff that was left over because I was a moving man right? right they hired me to clean out the apartment and uh and so I had got access to all this stuff and I mean there was just boxes of you know like scoop shovel in a, in a goddamn box and tape it up and get it out of there and I I couldn't throw it away I had I had to look at it so I took it to my house and eventually I started going through it and when I started doing that, that's when I started finding these poems that I'd never seen before, you know. And uh, and so I I said that to to Aaron. I said, "Would you be interested in?" Because uh, I knew that drum, the Drum Lemon, Rick Newby, the whole mission was to print Montana sort of authors, or... right? And not just uh, at least my sense of it. Um, you know, Rick Newby founded Drum Lumen, and the mission statement is great. I can't recite it from memory. You'd think I could, but um, uh, the part of it that really appealed to me was sort of neglected. You know, the right. writers that have fallen out of the mainstream for whatever reason. And I knew about uh, Ed Leahy just because of Rick D. Marinus, the year he and I read together at the festival um, after our reading. I asked him if he wanted to go get some lunch. And he said, uh, he said, well, I'm going to hear Ed Leahy read. You should come. He's a Butte guy. <laughs> so I did. I went over there and met Ed Leahy. Must have been the year before he died or yeah. toward the end. He was not in good, good health even then. Right. Um, so yeah, when you told me this awesome story about how you'd go read poetry with him when he was at the, he was at a nursing home, right? Well, in the end, he was yeah, he was at the he was at the village healthcare for a few years, yeah. But then, when you said you had this, you know, suitcase full of stuff you'd rescued, let's make a book out of it. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. great. Right. And then out of that that whole thing, when you know you you went out, we put the manuscript together and you made this book. And then we uh, we thought, well, we need to get this out there. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have to read Ed poems. So then I said, well, I got a whole bunch of friends. So like. Uh, Dave Thomas and and Robert Lee and yep. Cheryl Nothy and Mary Laura Wilson, who who is uh, the next uh, uh, book we talked about here, was Ed's ex-wife, and uh, and we asked her if she was interested too uh, in in joining the party. So you got to hear all of these people read their stuff, and and so we made an impression on you. Really, I mean, <laughs> I mean, seriously, they did, and then doing the Ed Leahy book, you know, on YouTube, there's some readings of Ed reading, like, that are just mesmerizing. And I think you may be part of those. And a lot of Missoula poets, I'd say that's probably uh, early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, those were done. I suppose, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't part of that. But uh, yeah, I know some of those old recordings. Roger were, Dunsmore. Was, was Roger yeah. was in there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I've, I've heard those, those tapes and, you know, what I've been able to find i guess i hopefully most of that stuff is in an archive over at the mansfield library it is. yeah it for, is for ed Leahy. Mm -hmm. so yeah so anyway that's that's kind of how we met and uh and then eventually after doing a couple of books for ed and then then i got you know i mean mary laura wilson and i were very good friends and she was a hell of a poet you know the the secret story about mary laura Wilson, uh, who was Mary Laura Leahy, I guess, at that time, was that, uh, I don't know how secret it is, but she uh, she used to kind of type Ed's poems up and stuff. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people, Dee Marinas and other people that I know have said, yeah, it's a good thing he had Mary Laura Wilson as an editor because she was a hell of an editor. I mean, she was just she was so specific and she she was a grammarian and she she just had a sense of what what language was all about uh and uh and so she definitely uh i'm sure probably helped in the uh transformation of some of those handwritten things 
to what happened on the page. Uh, not that Ed wasn't very capable on his own because he certainly was. Yeah, you know, it's funny too about um, Mary Lore, and I did, I did get to meet her. Right. Um, but after that book came out and I would tell people about it, it's amazing how many people in Montana know her oh, from yeah. all different kinds of things. Like she was the secretary at the law school, law school for a long time. So yes. all these lawyers in Helena that I would talk about this book to, they're like, oh yeah, I knew her from the law school. Right. And I recently wrote an article about the second story cinema, the little right. crystal theater sort of in, in Helena. Helena. Yeah. Um, which wasn't just a movie theater. It was an independent movie theater in the 70s and 80s that was, had a big influence on me growing up. Um, but they would also have poetry readings there. And okay. I interviewed the guy who founded it, Arnie Molina, recently. And he was telling me about one of the things he was most proud of was this uh, Women in Literature festival that they had. And the, the two women that he focused on, he said that he was recalling was Frida Fliegelman and Mary Lord Leahy. And I said, wow, really? I was probably there. So I probably I probably saw her when I was a kid. Yeah, well, and, uh, you know, I mean, one of the things when I started digging through uh, Mary Lord's, she, she has a bunch of poems that are still haven't been uh, seen in print. It's, it's like a, another book form. We took, you know, about 60 poems for this book summer lightning book that we put together but there's still poems out there and i know that you know other people like john holbrook was kind of looking into trying to assemble something for before she passed away but uh uh oh here yeah now i'm going to into that uh that, get to down this rabbit hole and i can't remember what the hell i'm talking about so what, <laughs> what was i talking about that he, there was enough material to do another book of hers maybe yeah God. Um, but I, I will remind people that Mark edited both these collections um, and wrote a uh, foreword to each one. And I think, you know, there were two really valuable contributions to Montana. To oh, letters, oh, oh so. they are totally. And uh, I mean, but, oh, I know what I was going to say. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, when I was going through stuff for Mary Laura, because she kept sending me all this stuff to go through. I found some things. She'd send me these envelopes and there'd be something in there and I'd be a few different versions of poems I'd already seen. But then there's this one copy of Scratch Gravel Hill. Oh, that Rick Newby Rick, also Rick did. Newby yeah, edited. Bill Hartman, I think, was in on that. Yeah, back in the 70s and yeah. early 80s. And, and Lowell and, Uda. Yes, exactly, Lowell Uda. And, and so, I mean, there was like, I don't know how many editions of this uh, literary journal. Mary Laura Leahy had, you know, several poems in there. And I, I found one that I hadn't found in all the stuff she'd sent me. And I don't remember which poem it was, but it wound oh, up great. in the book, you know. So, yeah, she was a, uh, she's a hell of a poet and a, and a wonderful human being. So, anyway, that whole experience working with, with Aaron and Drum Lemon to get Ed Leahy and, and Mary Lou Wilson in print uh, allowed me to, at some point, kind of suggest that, you know, yeah, if you get bored, maybe you could maybe you could do a book for me if you'd ever think about something like that. <laughs> um, well, yeah, when Mark came to me with this, I was already excited about it and knew it would be great and brought it to the board. Um, There's six people on our board. And oh, actually, I don't even have a vote as the executive director. So they voted unanimously to, to publish it. Um, but there are many things to love about this. Um, and it's, I think it's pretty different from your other books. Well, it, it, I think it is too. And partly because it's quite a bit bigger. It's, it's, I mean, it's longer. It's definitely longer, but it has more of a trajectory. Like it's kind of an emotional experience going through the whole book and it covers, you know, your childhood, uh, high school, right up into the Trump yeah, yeah, outrage. Present day. But Richard Fifield, who I'm sure everybody in Missoula knows well, um, when he blurbed it, I think that's one of the best blurbs ever. This collection is a flamethrower. <laughs> it kind of really is. And he, I, when I talked to him about it, he agreed. It's there. It's kind of a hard collection to read in ways. It's pretty raw. 
Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, hopefully, uh, it, uh, hopefully it hopefully it does whatever it does for whoever wants to pick it up and read it. I it is and it is a there's I mean there's four sections to it, and so they are kind of different. Each section is a little bit different. They weigh a little bit differently in different directions. And the last section is, yeah, kind of a hard pill to swallow, maybe. Uh, um, I just think maybe you describe it this way or somebody else that's kind of angry. There's a lot of anger in there. Yeah. And there's a lot yeah. to be angry about. For well, sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it was in the midst of the, those, the newer poems that were, you know, done right around the time of what we were going through in the summer of Trump just prior to the pandemic with the Black Lives Matter situation going on across the country and this constant barrage of fascist crap, whatever the hell you want to call uh, we, what we've just gone through. Uh, I don't even know how to describe it uh, uh, without, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm totally prejudiced because I'm, I'm it's, not, it's not a political thing. I mean, I, I, my grandfather, one grandfather was a, was a good Republican, uh, Beaverhead County Republican, and, and my other uncles on that side of the family all were, uh, they were, you know, they were great human beings, just like, you know, even 30, 40 years ago when I taught school over in uh, East, Eastern Montana, East Central Montana, I mean, that was, I was totally out of my element. I grew up in a working class family in a union household, so I have an Irish father, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously I'm not gonna be leaning too far to the right in my own particular way of looking at the world, but uh, those other people did. I mean, we all, we all were able to respect each other and live together and I taught their kids and we got along just fine and what the hell happened? I, I don't know what's, what's happened to the world, but uh, maybe we should read some poems. I think that's a great <laughs> idea. That's a great idea. <laughs> And I'll read a couple of poems. I don't even know. Oh, see if we managed to rattle on for 20 minutes. We're going to use an hour here, so brace yourself. <clears throat> uh, but maybe after you read a couple or ones that you had picked out, um, if they're not ones that I had in mind, would you read a couple that I would like to hear? Yeah, and okay. if you want to read something, you can do. I don't. I can't hold a candle to you. And well, I'll <laughs> let you do it. Uh, I just opened this up, and the, 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 one of the beauty, uh, the, the beautiful things about a book of poetry, I guess, is, is that you can just open the damn thing up uh, anywhere, and, and that's kind of a good way to read a book of poetry, I think. This one is, is an older poem, and it goes back to just uh, what I was talking about earlier, growing up in a small town in Montana, and this is called Spun Honey on Burnt Toast. I woke to muffled voices, dishes and pans clattering on the stove in the kitchen, smelled coffee and bacon cooking, my mother making breakfast and a lunch at 3 a.m. for my dad called to break a westbound freight for the Milwaukee Road. A pair of eggs basted in bacon grease, homemade bread toasted black, sliced an inch thick, slathered in butter and spread with spun honey. My dad also used to sweeten his coffee, boiled cloudy thick, strong and bitter, the darker the better. As dark as that Drexel siding on a moonless December night when his lantern battery died. It was like being stuck inside that long tunnel at Taft, blind as the dead must be. A teaspoon of honey smoothed the acrid edges, helped him swallow and chew like that fifth of whiskey in the pantry, now waiting for me. Those bottles stashed in the shed or his grip, just a nip from a flask or a pull off a pint, put a smile on the face of wasted days and nights, logging miles in the cold, hot, oily hours to stay afloat, buy food, shoes, coats, and soap, maybe grab at some time for a shot of hope, a chance to lick the nectar from the fire. Oh, why not? Uh, this one, uh, as a matter of fact, 
when I spoke to uh, your uh, better half, who is the editor of the Montana Senior News, That's right. uh, uh, Nan uh, Parrott uh, asked me if she could use this poem. And uh, to be honest, I don't know if she did, but. Uh... Um, yeah, I should uh, insert here that my wife, who is the editor of the Montana Senior News on the online version of it, you can go and hear uh, people reading poems. Oh yeah, seniors reading poems. So you, right. I know you're on right. there, right. and yeah. uh, I want to say Kurt. Maybe she got Kurt to do one. Yeah, and uh, I think David Cates is on there. Yeah, Robert, Robert did Robert be on them? Not, uh, there, there were several. Zan Bacchus, I think, might have been. Well, I don't know if Zan Rich. Hers might have just been print. Yeah. But there's this sort of experience of Montana poetry that that the Montana Senior News did. Yeah, a lot of it's oral. You know? Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, and oral goes along with this next poem. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, Nan liked this poem, so I'll read it. It's called Graphic Noise. Poetry is a voice speaking the truth the voice knows and singing within itself without reservations. It is the unpredictable, the rattler in the borrow pit, the oncoming headlights blinding glare, a priest smudging flag draped coffins, that ferry ride across the sticks, sticky pitch in the lounge chair, blind dates, redundant days of clouds and rain, boats and planes. It exists in all the animals I've loved and killed, tolerated and hated. Poetry is more rhythm than sense, more jazz than fear. But let's be clear. Poetry holds death at bay, then slips at the tongue, refuses to fold its hands and pray. It goes to its knees for an earful or a mouthful of sacred prophecy, prefers form over content that dictates the importance of form, permits one to lick chocolate syrup from their fingers and lips. Like Lucifer, poetry stands its ground, speaks its mind, is determined to be what it wants or needs. It does what it says sometimes and lies about the rest. If it sounds or feels like breaking glass or the rules, because it's always ready to steal the blues. It's a selfish stain, graphic noise, a song that refuses to play along. Poetry doesn't get the credit it deserves. It's been starved, slapped around, and told how to behave since mouths formed words and symbols were carved, scribbled down. It's been cornered and gagged, forced to pose and confess. Still, it's managed to survive expose and revolt, I guess. The poem lives in the gut, the throat, the ink and blood on the page. It cries out, tries to reach what it cannot save, that dank pleasure of sexy rage. That's awesome. Well, a lot of sounds. Uh, I'll read this. Uh, my son used this poem uh, uh, a few months ago uh, because he was asked to uh, marry a couple uh, back east, and uh, they were a French couple, and uh, my son is a French speaker. He, he's the one that translated Mauvais Herbe uh, from English into French and, and got it sold to a publisher in France, you know, which was very cool. I mean, I never, cool. I never even imagined that was going to happen, but he pulled all that off. So he, anyway, he liked this poem, and and since he was officiating this wedding, he he used it to to read the, at the wedding. So I thought, well, cool. It's called Drifters. Those who prefer the pastimes of playing and thinking are poets, whether or not they write. They know the moment, they know the moment is meant to be lived to the fullest, that every plan or analysis is 
bland noise to be pleasantly interrupted by wind in the leaves. They see nothing is within their control. All they do is ride the flow, the changing day to day unfoldings, note the patterns, desires, try to stay afloat, maintain their boat, enjoy the beauty, the oars in their hands, eddy out as often as they can. There will be rapids, rocks, debris, and eventually they will succumb to the inevitable falls awaiting all, the turbulent moment of change when they are rearranged into another molecular identity. That's great. He's a scientist, so maybe, uh, yeah, maybe that's right. <laughs> well, and there's uh, oblique references to Alberton in there too. You know, you, you said you were born and raised in a small town, but you, I don't think you said which one it was. Yeah. Maybe you could say a few words about Alberton. Growing up in Alberton. Well, I've got, there's a bowl of beer. Uh, yeah, I know there is. There's, a, there's more than <laughs> one, actually. Uh, and and uh, I'll, I'll put the positive one on first, huh? the, the more the sentimental nostalgic. I've been accused of being a sentimentalist more than once. Um, I, I have to say also that uh, recently my family, we drove to Butte and uh, somebody found in the, in the car a copy of this book and my wife started reading the poems aloud and for a whole hour we drove to Butte reading these poems aloud which was awesome because some of them are about Butte too yeah yeah, the guy, yeah. The one about the guy in Butte I thought was awesome well let me read that because yeah, I can't find the one I was just going to try to get about Alberton but we'll we'll find it here sooner or later but where is the Butte poem there it is uh yeah this uh yeah this uh, this 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 is called, uh, this poem is called Butte Rat. And uh, it's, a, it's dedicated to, a, well, it's not dedicated in here. It's dedicated to a guy named Dan Lavelle. His name's in the poem, I guess. So oh, there it is, first two words in the poem. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. Okay, so uh, Butte Rat. Dan Lavelle was a poet with impeccable credentials. He was a wild ass Butte Rat bound to a wheelchair after a mishap behind the wheel, involving speed, involving age and rage and alcohol, of course. His curse, our reward, was surviving the wreck, recovering, incurring, uncovering, and ensuring slurred speech and immobility for the rest of his days. They called it brain injury. He called it scrambled eggs and ham, no toast. Dan had trouble being taken seriously, and he was a serious guy about pulling your leg, copying a feel, or making you laugh at yourself. He knew how seriously funny human beings could be when they were being seriously human. Did I mention? He was a Butte guy, a working class knucklehead and aficionado of the big mustache, blood brother to the hell's angels, all those post-war po'boy testosterone fueled assholes, outlaw boomers living fast, dying hard and not giving two hell and a fucks for the prudence of governing suits or the tough talk of John E. Law. Danny Boy perfected his elephant man imitation. Don't laugh. For all the distractions, his bare ass dependence, those shocked glances, expressions of pity, repressed horror, and masked disgust at his slump and moan, his drool and leer, his eyes were alive on the stage of his face, pushing and pulling his heart across the page like Mick Jagger, Marty Robbins, Johnny Rotten, and Jimmy Reeves. Dan Lavelle was a poet who wrote love songs that crooned desire and despair. 
No one struggled to understand him there. He spoke clearly. He was a man of letters. Well, a sort of poetry man, maybe a little frilly, more of a ladies man, which was exactly what he wanted to be. Dan Lavelle was one hell of a poet, one mess of a bag of bones. He was a prankster, a pain in the ass who could make you laugh, make you cry. A tough little guy, a fucking butte rat who lived longer than he should have, perhaps, given the fact that he died and lived dead too long. But who ain't guilty of that? We're all hanging on till the pit comes for us, that nightmare poison dawning on our lust. So, girls, you can keep your panties on, because Dan the man has left the building. The richest hill on earth hangs on for the punchline. So sue me. Danny swallowed a gaggle of toxic geese, opened the floodgates of the maze, released the rats to dance with the piper who plays blinded by the light on blues guitar, growls like howl and wolf holding the keys to a 73 Camaro super sport, mag wheels still spinning in the middle of the air, revved up like a deuce in his Springsteen ear. The rats are loose tonight in Walkerville and running down the mean streets of Butte. It's great. So, Dan LaBelle was great, man. Did you know him here, or how did you know him? I knew him here, yeah. Because of, uh, uh, for a while, one of the, another organization that I worked with year, over the years was uh, Very Special Arts Montana. Very Special Arts Montana uh, worked in group homes mm -hmm. uh, with young people, and they worked in developmentally disabled group homes. And we offered these, I, I read poetry workshops, Cheryl Nothi and I and other poets, I'm sure, uh, worked with uh, uh, Very Special Arts where we taught these classes of, uh, of disabled peoples uh, on from different kinds of disabilities. Dan was one of those people. And, uh, and he was just a character. So did you work with Big Bear here? Big Bear. I worked for Big Bear. It was a group home for uh, developmentally disabled. No, people. no, no, Went not college year. Not specifically. No. Oh, okay. uh -huh. No, these are like usually taught outside of of, uh, of the group home. Gotcha. The, like Big Bear. Mm -hmm. Even though I did uh, work in some group homes, some youth group homes uh, around town, where I did go to the to the youth home, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes they, you know, we used to do some classes down at the. Uh, at the uh, fire department too. They had a, a room down there they'd let you do classes in. But uh, yeah, that's where I met Dan Lavelle. And so I was able to I was able to be in a couple, two or three, I think three. We did wound up doing three different classes together over the years. But uh, he was he was a class act. Um is driven is in there, isn't it? Yeah. Would you read that one? Yeah. Driven is the last poem in the book, actually. Uh, Driven is a, is a poem uh, dedicated to Melissa Stevenson. And uh, the title of the poem was stolen from an extremely incredible uh, uh, memoir, I guess you, you call it, uh, of uh, her brother. And, uh, and uh, so anyway, I, I, had, I had read the, her memoir and, which you is know, called dr driven. driven. Yeah. Driven, exactly. And uh, if you haven't read Driven, you you should check out Driven. It's an incredible book. And she's also a poet. I mean, she's a she's a hell of a poet. Uh, she was trained, I think, as a poet before she started writing prose, uh, kind of like Rick D. Marinas, kind of like that poem I read you the other day. Yeah. My God, or David Cage. I hate it when these goddamn prose writers just keep kicking the poets' asses. But uh, you know, I mean, they're, they they. Uh, there's there's so many uh, great fiction memoir prose writers that 
Uh, Alan Jones, Jones is they're also one. poets. Is that right? Yeah, yeah great. No, I'm, not as, I'm not as familiar with. He's been poems. writing a lot of poems lately. And... Cool. Yeah. Anyway, this poem uh, I I wrote. Uh, it was kind of just inspired, I guess, around the right about the time I finished reading her memoir, and so I wrote this for Melissa. Driven. The old man smiled at the precocious three-year-old serving him a beer in the backyard gathering after the funeral. She worked the group like a skilled barmaid, knew her cans and brands, remembering faces and orders without a hitch. He leaned toward me and whispered, she's been here before. Of course, it was a joke but also a metaphor, he was Irish for fuck's sake. Though it was obvious, she literally knew a hands from a Budweiser had done this before. He played up the ghostly myth that she was an old soul inhabiting a child's body. And I doubt he believed in reincarnation any more than he detested resurrection. But I loved the idea, the mystery. It made me think, imagine where she'd been and what I remember from being a kid, exposed to adults struggling and losing it, the pains and pleasures of surviving shit, plus death, that ultimate trip, the exclamation point, all of it, signifying nothing. Those boys and girls who get that early education grow older than their years, getting a jump on the jaded journey. Many have turned to art to manage bouts of obsession and depression. Maybe she will. I know I began talking to myself at an early age. I started out addressing God, but got no response. So I became my own best listener. My friends are driven to chase music and movement, shape language and form, create images, sounds, rattle bones to ashes, dust the cosmic storm, and follow their dreams into the unknown. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah, it's a good spot to be. Um, what about another one I really love in there, and it's a, a kind of a different poem, I think, for you. Punk, punked, podunk. No, it's podunk. No horse. Punks, punks. That's it. Punks in there. It's oh. a, toward the beginning. Okay. Um, and maybe you could just say what inspired it or what you were. Yeah, what's yeah, going yeah. on in there? Because I have this vision of you like listening to music while you were writing it. Oh, goddamn punks! Is that what it's called? Yeah. God damn punks, where are you? Maybe, uh, maybe that's why I like your poetry so much. I don't know any other poet who uses so many F words. Well, yeah, yeah, that's the other thing too, I guess, is it's, uh, <laughs> it's it is. I, I, that's why I told you I love the Frank Zappa documentary I, I, I watched last night, you know, it was like, uh, because just because a, a whole population or a whole generation of people, I mean, even even my dad's generation, you know, they knew that border, the same one that I know when I go in to teach kids in the classroom. I can't cross that border right. in fourth grade, right? But, and my old man never crossed that border when talking, you know, in a public sort of environment, there were women and children around and whatnot, but you get them out back right. and, and you know, and you're, you're, you're working on something, whether it's a vehicle or whatever, and the wrench slips and goddamn son of a Fucking bitch, you motherfucking piece of shit. God damn it. You know, that kind of talk was just the shit that you grew up around. And then, of course, it's the stuff I grew up around in a working environment when you're doing physical labor kinds of stuff. Part of it's the frustration, maybe. Part of it's the education because that's what you learn from other people. And part of it's just the goddamn fun of it. I remember the first time. I was, I was bucking bales, you know, uh, for this rancher. I was in high school and I'd heard all kinds of swear words, of course, 
but he had such creative sort of things, you know, and they were all farm based, you know, like right. that pig fucking mother. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was all, it was like a new brand of curse words you could get into. It was just fun. I, and, and it's just language. So what difference does it make, you know? But we're so hung up on, well, we're so hung up on a lot of different things, but language is one of the things that it's always kind of stuck in my craw. You asked me, oh, God, that's right. I saw it here somewhere. Oh, so this was written. I'll tell you what this, I'll tell you how this poem got written. Yeah. Before I re re read it to you. Is, uh, I have a good friend, uh, poet, incredible poet, uh, with a new book out this last year during the pandemic uh, called Homespun. Uh, 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 Kurt Sobolik is the poet's name. He, uh, great poet. Oh, God almighty. It, it, you, you've never read anything like Kurt Sobolik. You, you need to check out uh, uh, Foothills Publishing's Homespun by Kurt Sobolik. Anyway, so Kurt and I have been friends for probably 15 years, and we've just exchanged poems all the time and, and right back and forth and gotten together. And But music, too, and, and, and movies and video and all the things you do with your friends, right? So, But he lives out in the country, or kind of, he's kind of a hermit, right? So, he, Well, he's, he's, he's not a big sociable guy, yeah. yeah. And, the, uh, well, no, it doesn't really matter, but, I mean, he, he wound up buying a... Uh, a trailer that my mother had after she passed away, we had to get rid of this trailer. And so Kurt thought, I'll take it, you know? And so he, he wound up buying this trailer. And so I'm, that kind of keeps, it, it, yeah. it keeps us in contact too. But so anyway, Kurt, this, I don't know when he did this, but cause we were always sending each other stuff and he sent me, uh, maybe it was a, maybe it was a link to that, that documentary, that Runaways documentary on John Jett mm -hmm. did about three or four, five, six years ago. Yeah. I don't know how long it's been now, but uh, you know, I mean, I remember Joan Jett from the past and you know, she was just, I mean, I heard her more on the radio. I wasn't like spinning Joan Jett albums or anything. So when I, I think when I watched that documentary, it just kicked my butt. You know, she's I, awesome. She's oh, from Akron, Ohio. God, she is that right? I, I, so. I, don't, I, don't, I don't even recall that uh, aspect of. But anyway, so I, so I started listening to uh, to to Joan Jett again, and it was Kurt who sent it to me. So this was just basically it started out as an email response, and uh, so this is this is the poem. The poem is titled "Goddamn Punks." I came back for a pin, saw the inbox, and had to open and see who, and fuck you, William Carlos Sobo Willie, and that black-hearted cunt, Joan Jett, punk queen of rock and roll, for squeezing out a sonic scream trapped deep in my soul I had managed to ignore. Till now, God damn, she kicked my ass. And there's something really punk about that poem. I mean, it just it, it's. Oh, well, I poem. think I figured she'd appreciate it. Oh yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, um, maybe another reason I love it is in the '80s when that when she was kind of big. Um, I was in high school and I remember going into a bar in Townsend, Montana. So a real redneck, right? You know, country bar. And the jukebox was all country songs, except Joan Jett, I Love Rock and Roll. And my buddy went over and put like five dollars in it and just punched that song in <laughs> one time after the other um, and just sat by the jukebox. <laughs> oh. Um, we're supposed to leave time for questions. Too, oh, okay. So yeah. Oh, hell. I, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, there you are. I'm here. <laughs> um, I mean, and there aren't any questions in the Q&A, but um, I know you both know Russell Rowland. He threw out a question. Um, Aaron mentioned earlier that Mark's poetry is sometimes angry, and that's clear, but I wouldn't describe it as bitter. And I want to kind of throw in that in Richard Fifield's blurb, he writes, um, Mark will never be a bitter writer. 
Um, and then Russell continues, it feels more like the kind of anger that has a purpose, a forward motion. How do you keep writing when things are pretty frightening? And what do you have in store as poet laureate? And I'd like to add on to that question, how do you keep, when you're writing about anger, writing in anger or through anger, how do you keep the bitterness out of your, your poems? Uh, well, you know, I, I don't, uh, I, I, the, uh, I mean, anger is, uh, anger is a reaction, a, a, a fear reaction. I think, you know, anger is a reaction to fear. And, and what I fear, and I'll get, I'll get perclimped if I start talking about this shit, because it's like Cheryl Nolte and I were talking the other day. There are people that come from love and people that come from fear. Uh, and I really think that's very true. And, and I, we're, we're in the love category, you know, we're, we're fucking lovers. That's all there is to it. But God damn it, when somebody starts threatening that, it really fucking pisses me off. And my reaction to it is anger. And then I realize that that's not going to do anything. It's not going to do any good. It's, it, it's going to hurt me more than them. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to hurt them if I could. People who are hostile, who want to fuck with other people, who want to do horrible things. But at the same time, my reaction is, uh, is emotional. And I think, you know, that's, that's, that, that's there as a poet. That's kind of the reason why I am a poet. But uh, how, how do I stop from being bitter? I, there's nothing in bitter. There, there, there's nothing there. Who, who the hell wants to go there? I, I'm a lover. And I'm going to go there until the day I die. But anybody that tries to mess with anybody along the way, I hate fucking bullies. I've always hated bullies uh, on any level. And... Uh, you know, you got me all wound up here now talking about these emotional things. But uh, no, Russell, I, uh, I I don't know even what the hell Russell asked again at this point. Well, just I agree. I think the point is that there is some anger, and I wouldn't say it's the only emotion in this collection at all. But uh, you know, there's anger in in some of the poems. And his point was it's never bitter, and Fifield noticed it also. And I kind of feel like it's the opposite of bitter whatever that is i don't know what that well, is well it's hope i think yeah i think it's hope i mean i if we haven't got hope i don't i don't know what we've got and i think poetry is a great tool for hope and i think that's why um you know poets go back to it over and over again there are some uh i i guess i do understand uh, in a way uh part of that question or conversation or the reference to bitter because i mean i have i have read a few i read a lot of poetry I like to read poetry and I have read a few poets that I thought were uh, maybe a bit bitter and uh uh and I I don't know how I you wish you could help them uh I, I wish they weren't quite that bitter or or that uh um, Sylvia Plath strikes me as bitter a lot of that yeah I mean I like Sylvia too though I mean I liked her a lot uh I I thought she was uh, yeah she was uh, bitter is the right word, but uh, you know, and I might have her. She was depressed. Yeah, well, yeah she yeah. was definitely depressed. Uh, uh, and Sexton uh, along, yeah, along, was, along the lines of Sylvia could. I was just and, thinking. And Anne had a little, yeah, Anne had a little bit of. Uh, was she the one the dear daddy? Put the, uh, no, that was that was Sylvia. Yeah, yeah that was. Sylvia. But I mean, they were both sort of yeah, very kind of similar in ways, but totally different poets and very good poets, both of them. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Can you think of a, a bitter poet who isn't a woman? Uh, I was thinking of that first. There's, um, I'm trying to get the name. Well, uh, some of the Bukowski's pretty bitter. Oh, Bukowski, yeah, he's intentionally bitter. Yeah, Bukowski can be can be very bitter, but I, but you know, I mean, part of the thing with Bukowski too is that that he's. He is intentionally, he, when he wants to be bitter, he's just bitter, ugly, bitter. Yeah. And, and, then, and then he can turn around and do something different in the next, on the next page. I, you know, I mean, I, I, I think that's, I like a, a poet who writes in a range of things. And so I can handle a little bitter as long as they're not bitter one after another. You know, right. I mean, if they're bitter one after another, then I'll just probably move on. You know, there's a couple of <laughs> Edward Arlington Robinson poems that I think of as 
you know, there's some bitterness in those. Yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, poets that uh, that I have been reading here uh, lately, a lot of them are still alive too. Uh, and I don't really want to probably, you know, go down that road. But everybody has a right to write whatever they need to write. But uh, yeah, it's the dead poets that you can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, well, I guess like, is there is there a place for bitterness in poetry? Like, oh, hell, there's a place uh, for everything. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Yeah, Why not? I, I think so. You're a poet. The, 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 you know, do you write bitter poetry? No. No. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, do you write, I, I, do you I mean, write angry poetry? No, I write self-deprecating poetry. Yeah, well, that's that's kind of a Montana thing too. I think. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> it's finally explained. I don't know if it is or not, but a whole lot of people that I knew and grew up with, and, and so this whole self-deprecating thing is pretty much a part of there. And so it's a big part of humor too, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we've uh, we've heard a lot of poets being mentioned throughout this conversation. Mark, I'm wondering who you look to when you need inspiration. If you, when you're writing during the process, what, what, which poets are you reading um, to find that spark of inspiration? I'm just kind of always, I just always try to keep reading. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's really, I, you know, I, I hate these kinds of questions when I get them because it's like, God damn, you just all these, and you read this stuff and you set it and you pick up something else and you go and it's like, uh, and there's, I could go around and grab a stack and bring it out and say, okay, oh yeah, there's this, oh yeah, oh, oh, oh she's just fantastic or whatever, you know, uh, but uh, I don't know a lot of good on the, on the name, name and thing. I have the uh, same problem. People always ask me, like, what are you reading lately? Yeah. And I'm like, I, I try to visualize the stack of books by the day. Oh, you know, you know, it's, uh, it's just, I can't think of stuff off the top of my head. I, I just, I, I got for a birthday present, I just got the Poet Warrior, uh, Joy Har Harjo's memoir. I just read that. I, I read a book that uh, that Wendell Berry wrote about uh, William Carlos Williams called William Carlos Williams of Rutherford. I read uh, Kim Adnesio, you know, Kim Adnesio. I read uh, some kind of a goddamn thing uh, she wrote, which was uh, like, Bukowski's dress or something. It was kind of a memoir, but I'm, I'm always reading, uh, trying to read kind of around in that way, but I always also am just reading collections of, of poetry, you know, newer stuff and older stuff, stuff I've read before. I just, you know, Steve, the poet Stephen Dunn, I just went back to him again. I love Stephen Dunn. He was just a wonderful poet and he died here uh, just in the last year or so. He had Parkinson's disease like my sister. Uh, had and uh, yeah, there's just there's there's too damn many uh, poems to start listing. We have another question in the chat, which is Mark. How did you come to poetry? When did you start writing it, and and what what brought you to it? Uh, Jim Welch brought me to it. James Welch, yeah, and uh, he and and literally he wound up. He was working for the Arts Council, and he showed up at our school to teach a, a workshop on poetry. And uh, because uh, you know it sounded interesting, and we got out of the regular classroom <laughs> for like a week or two weeks, and uh, so I jumped on that. And as soon as I got a taste of it, I, I I've never stopped. I've never stopped. What what he did was he. He showed me that my own personal experience could matter to other people in words on the page. So you could mine your own world, your own life, your own experience in a goddamn podunk town like Alberton, Montana, or Harlem, Montana, or Browning, Montana, or Montana City, Montana. You could mine what was there, write it down, and it mattered to people. Uh, that was huge, mm -hmm. and uh, I've never ever stopped once once given that ticket to ride, and and I that, and I that's uh, one of the reasons why I continue to do it to try to teach, uh, give kids the opportunity. That's all you're doing as a teacher. You're giving somebody the opportunity to explore their own life. 
that was actually one of my questions is, you know, you are a teacher, you are going into these schools, often into rural schools, um, teaching poetry. I'm, I'm curious about what that process looks like, what you're teaching them, how, how you are bringing these younger minds into that world. Well, I mean, the, the key, the, the magic golden key uh, to do all that, uh, I got from Cheryl Nothi and, uh, and, and teaching for the Missoula Writing Collaborative for the last 25 years. And I just took that all along with me when I went to, on Arts Council gigs to go outside uh, to, to towns and schools outside of, of uh, the Missoula area. But Cheryl wrote a book uh, with the guy named Jack Collum, I think, called Poetry Everywhere. Uh, a few 20 some years ago, <laughs> wherever that long has been. And that book is full of great lessons. And a lot of those lessons have example poems, right, included in them. And I mean, so it's a, it's, and, and then of course, if you're going to write a poem about place, if that's going to be your focus, it's kind of like, okay, we're going to write a poem about place. So that's, that's a good place to start. We're going to think about a place you know a place that you know really well, you know? I mean, it's like, what's there? What's all the stuff that's there? And so when you when you start writing about that place and showing us what it's like there in the way that all writers try to do, right? Uh, you also, how you feel about that place, the place that you chose and what you decide to tell us about it and who shows up along the way in the process of making something, uh, it's going to, it's gonna be your poem. No one else is gonna write that poem because no one else is you and no one else is gonna have that exact same language, feeling, uh, choice of items in that place, whatever it is, that's gonna be a reflection of you. And uh, so that's what we do. We just do that kind of thing. And then, and so after we show them uh, some really good uh, formal examples, then we, because uh, there's uh, having done this for so long, you've got these tons and tons of kid examples. And so you can read them a bunch of kid poems other kids have written. And, and you can just see the light bulbs going off in their head. And they're like, okay, can we write now? Would you shut up and let us write? And so then they just take and they just they write like crazy. And then they get up and they share and they read their stuff. You know, I, whenever I see those old uh, Montana Arts Council books that, you know, the poets in the schools mm -hmm. that, that came out of those in the 70s and right, even in the 80s, right, right. I buy them all the time. And they're all poems by kids. And I don't even know if it says their whole name, just, right, right. you know, first name and where they went to school. But some of that is awesome oh, poetry. Oh, oh, amazing. Yeah, it's like, I remember, uh, oh, well, you know, the poet, uh, Chris Dombrowski. Chris used to teach for uh, the collaborative too. And I remember Chris, we were having a conversation with him years ago because he was also teaching at the university and saying, oh, 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 oh bar none. I, 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 get, I get much more interesting stuff here at wherever he was at, CS Porter Middle School or wherever the school he was teaching than I do in my freshman poetry class or whatever, you know, or, and uh, just because, you know, uh, the younger you are, the more raw, the more honest, the more open, the more real, the more likely to share possibly. The older you get, the more afraid you become, the more vulnerable you feel about exposing yourself or being put down by, you know, the powers that be. And, uh, but I think it's also, you know, you're the older you get, the more jaded you get. And, totally. you know, when you see a tree at 50, when you're 50 and you see a tree, it's just a tree. But when you're a kid and you're 10, it's like every tree is a work of art. And I think that one of the things I think I've learned from hanging around with poets like you is that the whole job of a poet is to make the world new again. Right. Like, what does it look like the first time you see that? you know whether it's a tree or some emotion or something right right and 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 to just get get back to it get back to the present and get back you know and and, and experience experience anew for the first time yeah. as a kid exactly just I like think. just like a kid yeah I think that's, that's what in the weeds kind of is about in a way you know I mean just that idea of a kid because that's what you used to do all the time as a kid right yeah oh you yeah lay in the weeds look at the clouds going by you know 
And then in college, <laughs> you sleep in the weeds a lot, or I did. <laughs> <laughs> or pass out, one of the two. Um, well, we've hit the hour mark, but Mark, I'm hoping you might kind of uh, kind of guide us out with maybe another reading, just to uh, read a poem to to end it here, and then I'll I'll say my thank yous. Sure. Uh, well, let's see something uh, not too long. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of loss uh, uh, over the last couple of years, and uh, so this might fit this little fairly short poem written in couplets called Condolences. I'm sorry, but it's what we do. We bury each other every day, somewhere. Mother, daughter, brother, sister, father, son, lover. Another shocking reminder, we're growing colder. How old we are when we stop breathing matters as much as nothing matters anymore. When someone dies and it's someone you know, someone you love. We live to die trying to love, dying to live. Today, I'm sorry someone died you loved. I will love living today. That's a great one. Great one to close out. Huh? Out the door. <laughs> okay, see ya. <laughs> um, no, that was a, a wonderful reading. And this was such a great conversation. I'm so glad that you two are in the same space. Yeah, and, uh, me too. Yeah, this, yeah. Was, this was a lot awesome. of fun. It's an honor, honor to be with you here. Yeah. So thank you, Mark and Aaron, for being with us today. Thank you, audience, for asking questions. Thank you again to our event sponsors, the Camino Mexican Kitchen and Agave Bar, Arts Missoula, MissoulaEvents.net, the Whitefish Review, Humanities Montana, and the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation. Uh, we've been throwing links out throughout the hour. Just as a reminder, you can purchase Mark's new book of poetry, In the Weeds, at Fact and Fiction Books. Be sure to enter MBF at checkout, uh, whether that's on their website at factandfictionbooks.com, or you can actually say it vocally to your bookseller if you're, if you're going to go into the brick and mortar. So um, thank you again for joining us. And thank you, Mark and Aaron, for having this thank really you, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, talk to you soon.